We're honored to be hosting the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Antonio Guterres, who tonight will be speaking on counterterrorism and human rights, winning the fight, a topic which represents one of the great challenges of our time. It's fitting that this event is taking place at SOAS. We pride ourselves on being a place of vibrant and challenging debate, outward looking, passionate and values driven. A description that equally applies to tonight's special guest. Antonio Guterres is the ninth Secretary General of the United Nations and took office in January this year. Prior to his appointment as Secretary General, he served as United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees from June 2005 to December 2015. And I had the privilege of working with Antonio during my time at the UN. We worked on some of the most challenging and difficult humanitarian crises facing the world. And he was a very, very special colleague. Antonio was Prime Minister of Portugal between 1995 and 2002. And as many of you will be aware, is a lifelong campaigner for justice and equality. Before I hand over to our special guest, a few housekeeping rules. Please put your phones on silent. Don't turn them off because we want you to tweet like crazy, but please <laughs> put them on silent. Our hashtag is UN at SOAS. The fire exits are on that side, on my left. Um, there is also an exit uh, uh, to the right. In terms of format, the Secretary General will speak first, and this will be followed by a discussion with the audience, which I will moderate. Now, I will say this again before we start that, but I can only take one question at a time. Not everyone will get their question in, given that we have um, uh, a time limit, and we have also been sent in uh, questions from those who can't be here. I will do my very best. And to the journalists in the room, I will do my best to bring in one or two of you, but the Secretary General is very clear that he wants as many students as possible to have the opportunity to ask questions. That's it from me by way of introduction. Please join me in welcoming tonight's very, very special guest, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I thank Thoas and Valerie Amos for bringing us together this evening. As Valerie said, I had the luck to be working side by side with her to support the most vulnerable of the vulnerable in the most tragic circumstances. And I have to tell you that uh, she is a leading humanitarian, a fantastic colleague, and a very dear friend. And I also want to thank all of you for being here to discuss about one of the most difficult and challenging issues of our time combating the global threat of terrorism without compromising our respect for human rights. Let me be clear from the outset. Nothing justifies terrorism. No cause, no grievance. Nothing can ever excuse the indiscriminate targeting of civilians, the wanton destruction of lives and livelihoods, and the creation of panic for its own sake. Terrorism has unfortunately been with us in various forms across ages and continents. But modern terrorism is being waged on an entirely different scale. It is notable for its geographic span. No country can claim to be immune. And it has become an unprecedented threat to international peace, security, and development. As conflicts have grown in intensity and number over the past decade, Terrorist attacks have increased and spread, destroying societies and destabilizing entire regions. 
Last year, at least 11,000 terrorist attacks occurred in more than 100 countries, resulting in more than 25,000 total deaths and 33,000 people injured. And while the spotlight tends to focus on terrorism in the West, we should never forget that the vast majority of terrorist attacks take place in developing countries. In 2016, nearly three quarters of all deaths caused by terrorism were in just five states, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Nigeria, and Somalia. It was estimated that the global economic impact of terrorism reached 90 billion US dollars in 2015, but this cost may be far higher. And in 2015, again, terrorism costs amounted to 73% of gross domestic product in Iraq and 16.8% in Afghanistan. Modern terrorism is not only different in scale, but also different in nature. It has grown more complex and with new modus operandi. How can one fail to be horrified by trucks and cars ramming into a peaceful crowd with the intent of maiming and killing? It happened here in the streets of London, but also in Jerusalem, Baghdad, Barcelona, and more recently in New York. How can one fail to be, how can one fail to be shaken to the core by the use of young girls less than 10 years old as human bombs in Maiduguri, northern Nigeria? It is an assault on our security and on our humanity. And the fact that the state of shock and terror of those murderous attacks is nowadays amplified by the 24 now hours near cycle, social media, and cynical political manipulation makes it even more impactful. This has brought an acute perception of insecurity among communities that challenge the social fabric. A secretary general of an organization established, and I quote, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors, end of quote, I am painfully aware and concerned by the risk of fragmentation posed by global terrorism. Dear friends, I'm here in London, and just down the road at the British Library you'll find original copies of the Magna Carta. More than 800 years ago, that charter established that nobody should be imprisoned without due legal process, and this established the principle of the rule of law. And it is no exaggeration to suggest that it laid the groundwork for the freedoms and liberties that terrorism directly assaults. At its core, human rights are a true recognition of our common humanity. They unite people, while terrorism thrives on divisions. And I'm here in London, humbled by the long journey across history that gave recognition to the aspirations of people to justice, freedom, and human rights. And those are the very aspirations that led so many young men and women when I was living under Salazar's dictatorship in Portugal to fight for human rights and democracy in my own country. And I believe it is you, the young people, who can take up the torch of those enduring aspirations. Based on all my experience and with a sense of urgency, I'm here in London to deliver a simple message. Terrorism is fundamentally the denial and destruction of human rights. And the flight against terrorism will never succeed by perpetuating the same denial and destruction. We must relentlessly fight terrorism to protect human rights. And at the same time, when we protect human rights, we are tackling the root causes of terrorism. For the power of human rights to bond is stronger than the power of terrorism to divide. Dear friends, let me reiterate two important points. Number one, terrorism should not be associated with any religion, ethnicity, or race. And number two, there is no excuse for terrorism. Let me stress this once more. Article 5 of the International Convention for the Suppression of Terrorism Bombing states that, and I quote, such criminal acts are under no circumstances justifiable by considerations of a political, philosophical, ideological, racial, ethnic, religious, or other similar nature, end of quote. 
Contrary to the propaganda of terrorist groups, terrorist acts are not legitimate murders, but murders plain and simple and as such criminal acts. But we must admit that there are indeed conditions conducive to terrorism and violent extremism. And if we want to address and avoid the gap between this global threat and our collective response, we need to pin them down. First, it is clear that terrorist groups exploit conflict zones and ungoverned territories. While terrorism often starts in conflict zones, it reaches far beyond them, organizing and inspiring attacks and radicalizing people across borders and continents. Second, lack of development and inclusive governance, including extreme poverty, inequality, as well as exclusion and discrimination are also drivers for terrorism and violent extremism. Income inequalities are a growing trend within both developing and developed countries. But a new study on the threat of violent extremism in Africa found that lack of education and poverty were factors behind radicalization, but that the final tipping point was often state violence and abuse of power. 93% of all terrorist acts between 89 and uh, 2014 occurred in countries with high levels of extrajudicial death, torture, and imprisonment without trial. And third, internet has become an asset for terrorist groups to disseminate violent extremist propaganda, recruiting new converts, and raising money. It was first used in the 90s by white supremacists in the United States to reach a wider audience easily and cheaply, giving a voice to many forms of racism and anti-Semitism. The recruitment of violent extremists through social media is nowadays central to Daesh terrorist campaigns. Although the drivers of radicalization to violence vary from country to country and even within countries, terrorism draws strength from resentment, humiliation, and lack of education. And terrorism thrives where disenfranchised people meet nothing but indifference and nihilism and it is deeply rooted in hopelessness and despair. That is why human rights, all human rights, political and civil rights, but also economic, social and cultural rights, are unquestionably a part of the solution in fighting terrorism. Dear friends, the threat of terrorism is real, dangerous, and unfortunately here for years to come. Member states have a primary responsibility for protecting their citizens. And as former Prime Minister, I know all too well this priority to enhance safety and security. Military operations in Syria and Iraq have evicted Daesh from its strongholds in Mosul and Raqqa. But it would be a mistake to assume that military operations alone will eradicate terrorism. Technology still enables terrorist groups to reach disenfranchised people everywhere in the world and impress on them. This is why a smart and comprehensive counter-terrorism global strategy addressing root causes of violent extremism is all too vital. And I'd like to suggest five key counter-terrorism priorities and underscore our respect for human rights and the rule of law will secure long-term benefits in the fight against it. Number one, we need much stronger international cooperation on counterterrorism. I heard this message loud and clear, clear during the high level week of my first General Assembly of the United Nations segment in September. 152 leaders, 80% of all members of the UN, highlighted the need to step up the exchange of information to be more effective in fighting terrorism. In a globalized world, the failing of one state can quickly become a threat to its neighbors and far beyond. Our watchwords should therefore be unity, solidarity, and collaboration. And it means unity at the United Nations. One of my first reforms as Secretary General was to create a counterterrorism office to coordinate the 38 different UN groups and offices working in this area. And I intend in that regard to develop a, U a new UN system-wide global counterterrorism coordination compact. But it means unity in the international community. There is an urgent need for governments and security agencies to collaborate more effectively in fighting terror 
while respecting human rights. There is still no consensus on a comprehensive convention on international terrorism. But there are 19 different international conventions and many regional instruments in this field that make it easier to prosecute terrorists, enhance protection, and cooperate in other key areas. They are a true manifestation of the international rule of law. Signing them and ratifying them is not enough. All governments must get serious about implementing them. And furthermore, resolutions of the Security Council often complement those conventions. The Security Council has imposed sanctions against terrorist groups, but it has also played a leading role to enact common rules on foreign terrorist fighters, financial measures against terrorist groups, and more recently, international judicial cooperation. Capacity building and appropriate expertise remain crucial for all member states to implement those provisions. And member states also need to increase international efforts to address the sources of financing, including suppressing money laundering and illicit trafficking. But these multilateral efforts are insufficient against today's threat. Security services on the ground also need to get better at exchanging information and acting on it, respecting always human rights. To give just one example, police in certain countries are divided into local forces which literally speak different languages and are reluctant to share information. It is time for a new era of intelligence sharing and collaboration to save lives. As a small contribution to these efforts, next year I intend to convene the first ever UN summit of heads of counterterrorism agencies to forge new partnerships and to build a relationship of trust. Dear friends, the second key route to more effective counterterrorism is a sustained focus on prevention. First, preventing conflict and sustainable development are our first line of defense against terrorism. When I took up the position of Secretary General, I made this a priority, calling for a surge of preventive diplomacy. The international community is already addressing some of the drivers of violent extremism. The 2006 UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy sets out strategic priorities and comprehensive recommendations. One of its four pillars is ensuring the full respect of human rights and the rule of law when countering terrorism. Prevention is true, includes deterrence. We need strong cross-border cooperation to make sure that highly trained terrorists who travel to join conflicts and commit atrocities face prosecution and the national laws if they return. But prevention also means addressing the factors that radicalize young people and make terrorism an attractive option for them. Second, development is the best way to tackle the poverty, inequality, and lack of opportunity and public services that feed despair. Development is an important goal in itself, but should never be seen as a means to an end. But it is also true that sustainable and inclusive development can unquestionably make a decisive contribution to preventing conflict and terrorism. The United Nations development system helps governments tackle some of the root causes, poverty, inequality, youth unemployment, and the lack of public services, such as health and education. Right now, United Nations agencies are supporting national governments in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The world's shared blueprint for peace, prosperity, dignity for all, but also a powerful antidote to some of the causes of terrorism. Third, investment in young people must be a major element of any prevention strategy. Most new recruits to terrorist organizations are between 17 and 27 years old. Extremist groups can exploit feelings of disillusionment and alienation, offering a twisted sense of purpose to disaffected young people, including women and girls. And one major reason for this is lack of opportunity. Jobs, education, and vocational training for young people must be an absolute priority in national development plans and in international development cooperation. Young people are an overwhelmingly positive asset to our societies. We must invest in them and empower them. It is no surprise that the Kingdom of Jordan, with so many threats on its borders with Syria and Iraq, has wisely led efforts in the United Nations on the role of youth in countering violent extremism and promoting peace. And we stand with all young victims of terrorism, from the Chibok girls of Nigeria, to the Yazidi women and girls of Iraq, to young boys coerced into atrocious acts. Fourth, we must place greater attention to the gender inequalities and stereotypes that drive terrorist groups. 
regardless of the religious and philosophical ideology of these groups, one common element of their agendas is the subjugation of women and girls. In parts of the world, they are being sold into sexual slavery to finance terrorist groups, and sexual violence itself is used as a tactic of terror. And fifth, prevention also means winning the fight on the internet. Terrorists are losing physical ground in Syria and Iraq, but getting virtual ground in cyberspace. Beating them will require coordinated and determined global action. Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, and YouTube have launched an anti-terror partnership, the Global Internet Forum to Counter-Terrorism, aimed at thwarting the spread of extremist content online. This is a start. We need to keep up the momentum. And I welcome recent advances in this area by the British, French, and Italian governments at the United Nations General Assembly. We will never be able to prevent terrorists from communicating entirely, but we, might make, we must make this as difficult as possible. Number three, upholding human rights and the rule of law is the surest way to prevent a vicious circle of instability and resentment. Terrorist groups, including Daesh and Al-Qaeda, thrive in conflict zones, Iraq, Syria, and Libya most notably. Violations of international humanitarian law are correlated with protracted conflict and radicalization. I therefore call on all parties to conflict with a deep sense of urgency to respect and ensure respect for international humanitarian law and human rights in situations of armed conflict. Taking all precautions to avoid civilian casualties, giving full access to humanitarian assistance, running detention centers in accordance with the status of prisoners of war, Prohibiting torture, these all measures speak to who we are. But it's not only about our values, it's also about efficiency. These rules were codified in the 19th century to prevent the suffering of war victims in modern conflict. Henri Dunant was well known as instrumental, but lawyers from the United States with the Liber Code in 1863 and in Russia, with the Martin's Clause, the United Kingdom, France, and many other countries, all contributed. They go far beyond regulating the conduct of war on the battlefield. They ensure that lasting peace and reconciliation will be possible. Facing threats of an unprecedented nature, states are scrambling to enhance efficiency of their counterterrorism legislation. Heightened violence, vigilance and target surveillance are essential if we are to disrupt terrorist networks, track their activities, and target their finances. But without a firm basis in human rights, counter-terrorism policies can be misused and abused. They can actually make us less safe by undermining good governance and rule of law. As I said earlier, terrorism is fundamentally the denial and destruction of human rights, and the fight against terrorism will never succeed by perpetuating the same denial and destruction. This raises very difficult questions. How can governments take preventive sec security measures without undermining due process and legal safeguards? How can they adapt judicial systems to make more prepared in the face of imminent threats? What legal safeguards should control state surveillance? How can we ensure effective border control while re-establishing the full integrity of the refugee protection regime. I firmly believe that the principles of international criminal law offer a unifying framework. A great Italian thinker during the Age of Enlightenment, Cesare Beccaria, laid the groundwork for those principles in 1764. He said there should be no punishment without a law. The right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty according to the law, and that punishment should be proportionate to the crime committed. Those principles are reflected in the International Human Rights Convention, and they remain as relevant as ever. But unfortunately, counter-terrorist policies may be used, and are being used, to suppress peaceful protests and legitimate opposition movements, to shut down debate to target and detain human rights defenders and to stigmatize minorities. Such measures do not contribute to lasting peace. Instead, they may contribute to lasting instability and resentment, generating chaos.
I reiterate that society is based on respect for human rights and economic opportunities for all represent the most tangible and meaningful alternative to the recruitment strategies of terrorist groups. Fourth, we must win the battle of ideas. We should never shrink from pointing out the cynicism and errors of terrorism. At a new heart of darkness, we should build a new age of enlightenment. When terrorists portray violence as the best way to address inequality or grievances, we must answer with non-violence and inclusive decision-making. When terrorists claim to be punishing people they accuse of betrayal or exploitation, we must point to robust judicial systems and legal accountability. We must address messages of hate with inclusivity, diversity, the protection of minorities and vulnerable people. We need to invest in social cohesion, education and inclusive societies where diversity is perceived as a richness, not a threat, and where everybody feels that his or her identity is respected and that they fully belong to the community as a whole. Political, religious and community leaders must fulfill their responsibilities in promoting a culture of tolerance and mutual respect, fighting bigotry and patriarchy, standing up for free media and the right to dissent, promoting the rule of law, demanding accountability and justice, the brave, the brave activists and civil society organizations that take on these issues are keeping us all safer. De-radicalization can work. Repentant terrorists should understand that this change is possible and we must pay attention to how they turn their backs on false ideals. Teacher, academics and social works are on the front line and they also protect us. I acknowledge and honor their contribution and I urge everyone with influence to support them. Fifth and finally, we must lift up the voices of the victims of terrorism. Some of our best guides are the victims of survivors of terrorist attacks who consistently call for accountability and results, not blanket measures or collective punishments. I welcome the decision of the General Assembly to establish an International Day of Remembrance and Tribute to the Victims of Terrorism to be observed every year on the 21st of August. And I pay tribute to the communities around the world that are showing resilience in response to terrorist attacks. They are countering violent extremism every day in their homes, schools, and places of worship. Here in the United Kingdom, the entire city of Manchester came together earlier this year in an inspiring example of solidarity and unity. And in London, your mayor, Sadiq Khan, described terrorism, and I quote, as an assault on our shared values of tolerance, freedom, and respect. We must resist stereotyping and seeing vast communities as monoliths if we are to develop effective ways to fight this menace. Stereotypes have many sources, including the media. We all have a responsibility to base our narratives on facts and to avoid doing the terrorists' work for them by demonizing or stigmatizing certain groups. In some countries, the majority of terrorist plots and attacks are perpetrating by right-wing extremist groups. And yet, the media focuses far more on attacks by immigrants or members of ethnic and religious minorities. Refugees fleeing conflict are frequently targeted. It is a horrible distortion to their plight to accuse victims of terrorism of the crime they have just fled. We are failing in our duty when we refuse to support all those affected by terrorism, the communities, victims, survivors, and their families. These groups constantly remind us that without a criminal process, there is no possibility of justice. When we respect the human rights of victims and provide them with support and information, we reduce the lasting damage done, done by terrorists to individuals, communities, and societies. Dear friends, Early this year, I sat in a tent in Kabul talking to some of the victims of terrorism. The women I met had been forced from their homes by a wave of bombings. They had lost everything. They told me of their will to return home, to rebuild their lives, to get their children back to school as soon as peace and security would be reestablished. They had not lost their face in our common humanity they kept hope alive, and we must do the same. 
We cannot allow terrorism to challenge the fundamental principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter, in national constitutions and international law. The foundations of our global order are the strongest protection we have against this scourge. We can only win this fight by upholding the dignity and worth of the human person. Principles, however, will not be enough. I call on world leaders to lead, and I want them to tell that beyond security measures, we need education, social cohesion, and respect for human rights. That is how young people will avoid distant illusions and become clear thinking and enlightened citizens. We have work to do, and I urge you all to join. Thank you very much. For your attention. Antonio, thank you so much for an incredibly uh, wide-ranging speech, which not only set out some of the challenges we face, but uh, also focused on some of the things that we need to do. Um, but if I may take Chair's advantage just for just one moment before I turn to the audience. Um, you talked passionately about the importance of this being something that we all work on together, and that all member states of the United Nations need to work on together. And yet we see day after day member states of the United Nations who have signed up to the principles of the Charter not actually taking their accountability and responsibility seriously, particularly when it comes to human rights. What do you say to them? Well, first of all, uh, we need to do everything to avoid it and we need to have permanently a... a pedagogic uh, 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 relationship with them to make sure that they can avoid this kind of behavior, showing them that that is counterproductive. Uh, as I said, the majority of those that went into terrorist actions come from countries where human rights are violated, and that violation is sometimes the trigger of someone to join uh, a, a violent uh, group or to go to fight uh, somewhere else, as you know, in uh, the different uh, conflict theaters we have in the world, or to become a terrorist in their own country. So this is counterproductive. Then uh, we need to use the uh, UN human rights instruments, uh, and there are a number. We have the Human Rights High Commissioner, we have commissions of inquiry, we had uh, special rapporteurs, we have a number of elements, uh, and uh, ideally, in some circumstances, we should have the capacity to have the Security Council acting. Now, it is true that um, the Security Council has been very reluctant uh, in uh, uh, taking decisions in the difficult situations. We all know there are divisions. And there is a, 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 a difficult conflict between the so-called national sovereignty agenda and the human rights agenda. And uh, uh, to be clear, uh, comparing things with uh, what I witnessed when my time in government in the 90s, I think that we have to recognize that the national sovereignty agenda has gained ground in relation to the human rights agenda recently. And in many situations, the only thing we can do is to speak out. You have done it many times as uh, head of uh, the UN humanitarian uh, action to speak up uh, and to be able to denounce uh, those violations uh, that uh, it is impossible to address uh, in any other form. Thank you. I'm going to turn over to our audience. I can see many hands up um, already. Are you going to take one question at a time or do you want to take two, three at a time? How would you like to do it, Antonio? I prefer one on one. One on one? one, on one? Okay, so... You know, when in my time in Parliament, we used to sometimes try to have five or six in order to avoid the most difficult ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't do that. So we'll take... Uh, yes. And then I'll come over here. Thank you, Antonio. Um, you mentioned the importance of the rule Sorry. of law. Where are you? Because I... Oh. Yeah. And perhaps um, say who you are very quickly. Sure. Um, my name's Esther. I'm on the Master's Programme for International Politics. Um, so you mentioned the importance of the rule of law in holding those account, um, responsible for terrorism to account. Do you think the Obama administration was um, perhaps errant in choosing to assassinate Osama bin Laden rather than capturing him, perhaps, and putting him in front of a criminal court? Sorry. 
The question was, do you think that the Obama administration would have been better capturing Osama bin Laden rather than killing him? Given what you said in your speech about uh, what states should do and the importance of rule of law. I, you're at SOAS. You're not going to get an easy question. It is, it, <laughs> it is obvious for me that uh, the right way to do these things is uh, to make sure that there is effective accountability and effective accountability means that we bring the person into a court and that that court condemns the person and then uh, things follow uh, in that direction. We came to a situation in which um, this has been replaced by the concept of war on terror, which means that for many states, um, the fight against terrorism is being handled not uh, in the context of uh, uh, the, the way to, uh, to fight it uh, in line uh, with a certain number of uh, um, procedures like the ones that we were discussing, but as a, a simple war. Um, I hope that this concept does not gain ground, because if this concept gains ground, the risk of this becoming a, a kind of a, a self-enforcing mechanism, of um, self-enhancing mechanism for terrorism itself is, is, is real. I mean, the most important way to fight terrorism is to avoid the capacity of terrorist organizations to recruit. And the capacity of terrorist organizations to recruit depends highly on the way terrorism is fought. And um, uh, sometimes the difficult way is the most effective. The easy way looks more spectacular, but might be less effective in the long term. Thank you. I've got, yeah. Uh, good evening, Secretary General. Uh, thank you very much for your very inspiring speech. My name is Dylan Kawende. I'm a second year student at UCL um, and an Amos Bursary Scholar. Um, my question is, how do we reconcile living in a free and open society with the protection of its citizens? And do you think it's quite unrealistic to suggest that we can reduce the risk of terrorism to zero, which I imagine is a sentiment that we all share most? I do believe that protection of citizens is essential. I do believe governments need to have uh, a number of uh, important mechanisms. Uh, intelligence uh, is essential. Uh, the capacity to infiltrate groups, to get uh, adequate knowledge about what they're doing, and to be able to uh, persecute them effectively uh, is, is essential. Um, what I believe is that uh, uh, to do it effectively, uh, it is impossible, not, it, it is necessary not to mix fighting terrorism with what happens in some parts of the world in which, uh, based on the idea that we are fighting terrorism, we just put in jail leaders of the opposition or we uh, uh, close uh, newspapers or we uh, inhibit the space for the civil society to work. So it needs to be clearly a set of measures targeting terrorism and not using terrorism as a pretext to do other things in relation to the, because what we want is to protect the freedom, the freedom of our uh, citizens. But uh, your concern was in the protection of citizens, if I... Uh, and, and reconciling that with uh, free, uh, being a free society. With reconciling that with being, living in and being in a free society. So, it's exactly what I said. You need to concentrate these in specific measures that target terrorist organizations and gather intelligence in line with the, the rule of law and not mixing it with uh, the kind of other measures that we see in some parts of the world. Um, but one thing for me is clear. It would be an illusion to think that we will be able to completely eradicate terrorism in the near future. And that is why I found the example given by the citizens of Manchester so inspiring. Uh, because instead of uh, uh, reacting, uh, as in some parts of the world has happened, uh, uh, dividing, persecuting uh, groups or what, there was a, uh, 
come together and there was the capacity to completely distinguish what is a terrorist attack from communities that have nothing to do uh, with the terrorists themselves uh, just because they share the same ethnicity, the same religion or the same political background. And uh, this extraordinary example is what I think is inspiring, which means we will not be able to eradicate terrorism, but we need to make sure that terrorism does not change the structure of our societies, the principles of our freedoms and of our democracy, and uh, the, our way of life, uh, uh, and the way we are able to uh, build uh, resilient and uh, uh, tolerant societies um, uh, in the community. Thank you. Um, I'll choose, in a, keep your hands up please, but while you do that, there's a question that came in on social media. The term terrorism has become so diluted in current discourse is it still useful or has it lost its value? So, the term terrorism has become so diluted in current discourse. Is it still useful or has it lost its value? I think that uh, it is clear what terrorism is. And I think it's uh, clear that we know what it means, even if it was impossible for the member states to come together and adopt a definition of terrorism and a convention against terrorism. There are these 19 different specific conventions. But I think the term terrorism is perfectly adequate to describe what are indeed terrorist acts. What is unacceptable is to use the term terrorism to describe other uh, forms of oppression that uh, uh, might happen in some parts of the world uh, and uh, against which we must also fight with the same determination. First of all, thank you for taking the time to come to speak with us at SOAS today. My name is Sekunder and I'm a postgraduate student in International Studies and Diplomacy. My question is a bit more human rights focused. What is the UN's current role in mediating the Kashmir conflict given the escalation in human rights violations in recent times? And do you see a viable solution to the dispute? Thank you. I think some people think that um, in a conflict situation, we need to close our eyes to all the crimes committed in order to be able to achieve peace or to have effective mediation. I believe that no peace will be sustainable without accountability, which means that I believe that all the efforts that are made to create conditions for peace to be established need to have a component of uh, truth, accountability, as conditions for effective reconciliation. So the idea that we can just forget about human rights to have effective mediation is, in my opinion, a completely false idea. Okay, thank you. And the next question there, and then we'll come over here. My name is Azamati. Sorry, where are you? Over my here. name is Azamati. At the, yeah. At the back, yeah. Every company manufactures things so that they are able to sell it to specific customers. From 1947 to 1989, during the Cold War, there were less than five bomb manufacturing institutions, uh, companies in the United States and other members of the Security Council. Now, during that year, those bomb manufacturing companies earned something in excess of $300 billion. It means that they sold their bombs that they manufactured to the warring factions. Now, those, the, war, the Cold War era is no more. But then it is believed Can that... Can I ask you to come to your question? Because I've okay. got a lot so of... So my people. question is that Thank you. the uh, members of the Security Council who are supposed to help in pro protecting... Sorry. Who are supposed to help in countering terrorism host institutions that still manufacture bombs and they tax them and they get money from them. Now, how feasible is the United Nations idea of countering terrorism if these same countries are the countries that have institutions that produce bombs and these bombs are sold to individuals that um, carry out terror acts? Thank you. I am a true believer in disarmament and I am a true believer that uh, um, uh, the one of the tragic things of our age is that we spend much more money in uh, 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 military equipment than we spent in humanitarian action. 
this is the truth. But um, that is the reality of our world. And uh, it's not by chance that the most important powers in the world are also the biggest exporters of uh, war material. I do believe that there isn't, I don't think that there is any country that sells weapons to terrorists doing it on purpose. I don't think it happens like that. What is true is that when we have a market and then the market becomes uh, expanded, terrorist organizations also benefit from the existence of that market. Whatever can be done in relation to disarmament is essential. Uh, there are some important steps. Uh, there was, as you know, uh, agreement in relation to, chem to chemical weapons, in relation to um, uh, uh, nuclear disarmament is in, unfortunately uh, not going uh, fast, uh, practically stalled uh, since the big agreements of the uh, end of the Cold War. Um, uh, the last between Gorbachev and, and Reagan, and for afterwards, after, unfortunately, the nuclear disarmament has not made any progress. There were important uh, measures in relation to, for instance, uh, the important conventions in relation to um, uh, personal mines, in relation to um, uh, cluster bombs. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the traffic of small weapons that, uh, again, is covered. Uh, but, uh, unfortunately, we still have uh, military industry with a very important uh, weight uh, in uh, many economies, especially in the economies of the biggest countries. So going here next, and then I'm coming to you after that. Hi, sir. My name is Yatana. I'm an undergraduate student here, and I also lead the SOAS UN Society. My question is, how can we as students contribute to the UN's agenda and strategy to combat terrorism? Thank you. I think it's being fully assuming citizenship. And I think it is uh, making sure that societies understand that diversity is a richness, not a threat. Terrorists today do not need to have an organizational mechanism to come to any community to recruit people. Through the internet, it's very simple to uh, those that feel disenfranchised, that feel discriminated, that are horrorized by things that they believe are uh, uh, the responsibility of uh, certain countries or, or uh, certain groups, uh, those that uh, today are recruited by terrorism can be in any community. Uh, and this is the biggest danger, uh, because th those uh, mechanisms and operations that are done through a more sophisticated system that involve international cooperation within terrorist groups, etc., are more easy to detect and are more easy to, to fight. And there has been a lot of progress in the capacity of intelligence services to dismount those operations. But the problem is that all of a sudden, somewhere, nobody expects someone picks a knife or goes to the supermarket, buys a number of things according to something that is in the internet and manufactures a bomb and uh, kills a number of people or comes with a gun and kills a number of people. The best way to avoid these situations is to create an inclusive society, is to make sure that people understand that diversity is a richness, not a threat, and uh, to, to bet in the social cohesion of the community, where, to work for the social cohesion of the community where we live, uh, for everybody to feel that their identities are respected, but at the same time that they belong. And this is not something that governments alone can do. This is something that citizens, the civil society, has to do. And I think there, each one of us has a responsibility to make our societies vaccinated against terrorism thanks to the social cohesion and the mutual respect that the different parts of the community are able to enjoy. Okay, I'm going to take a question there. Uh, and then I'm coming downwards. I've got this one next. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I, uh, my Sorry, name, where are I'm you? I'm up here. <laughs> uh, my name is Clio Esonoekani. I'm a master's student in international studies and diplomacy. And thank you very much for the solutions that you have presented for countering terrorism. I personally think that a lot of the answers to the issues of terrorism are found through the answer, through the answers to um, a question that is not addressed often enough, and that is what do terrorists or what does terrorism want? 
Right. Terrorism wants to terrorize. That's the logic, no? Uh, which is, that's what makes terrorism different from any other crime. It's the idea to create panic in a society. It's an instrument of war. Um, why, do, why does someone come to that position, that to want to terrorize. Um, I think that uh, this depends a lot on the frustrations, the feelings of discrimination or persecution that can exist in many societies. It's not true that it's only poverty. On the contrary, sometimes we see it in middle class uh, families. It's the sense of injustice or discrimination that may lead in, in several situations, people, some and sane, some sane, but uh, to this kind of desperate response. Uh, what we need to be able to explain to them is even if the cause they fight for is absolutely just, and there are many injustices in the world we can fight for, even if there is a good reasons for them to feel uh, angry or to feel uh, to, that there is a grievance, the terrorism can never ju be justified by that anger or that grievance. Uh, and that people should fight for their ideals in different ways, uh, but never through terrorism. And this is something that requires a lot of investment in the cohesion of societies, in educational systems. Um, and uh, if one looks at uh, uh, the most impacted areas, namely the Middle East and North Africa, today, youth unemployment is a dramatic factor. And we see very little effort in international cooperation to address specifically as a total priority the problems of youth unemployment. And there are lots of things that could be done. I, I feel sometimes when, uh, uh, for instance, in the cooperation of the European Union or of Europe with a country like Tunisia. Tunisia uh, did a fantastic uh, democratic transition. Tunisia is an example of uh, how a country could uh, take out a dictatorship, create a democratic society, and doing it uh, in, in a way that even Islamic parties can be integrated in the, the, in the system. And yet, Tunisia has furnished, uh, has provided a large number of uh, warriors to the wars in Syria and in Iraq, and of course, with a major terrorist threat. The reason, 40% unemployment in youth. And I think for Europe, to support Tunisia, it would not be very expensive, to support Tunisia uh, in order to address the problems of unemployment of its youth and uh, to receive also part of these uh, young people in different ways of uh, uh, training or in temporary uh, uh, jobs and then allowing them to come back and to do something useful in their own country. I mean, to support Tunisia on this would be, in my opinion, much more important than just to try to convince Tunisia not to let people put themselves in boats and come to Europe. And this is the priority that uh, we, I have not yet seen in international cooperation. Youth and employment being, in my opinion, the most important objective that should exist in national development plans and international cooperation. I see lots of hands. Um, I have got a list. Uh, I'm not sure we can get through it all. Antonio, I'm going to have to ask you to make your answers a little briefer. We can get through. <laughs> we always had this when we were at the UN, so we can get through more questions. Yes. Um, so we have one here, and then I'm going to come over to, to the gentleman here next. Mr. Gutierrez, my name is Francisca. I'm Portuguese and I'm a master LSE student. You can speak in Portuguese if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so that everyone understands. On what you just said about addressing the roots of the problem, I'd like to ask, what is your message for young people around the world that are affected by high grievances in the communities, such as poverty, unemployment and corruption, to stand up to terrorism happening in their own communities and countries, instead of joining terrorist organizations? especially in developing countries, because often these motivations are the ones who make young people engage in war and conflict and acts of terror that affect us all. Thank you. I think that what you said is the demonstration that we need to bet strongly on prevention and to create the conditions for people not to feel so desperate that they easily embark in the propaganda of terrorist groups. I'm Ari Buller from the Middle East, in London. Um, in your speech, you spoke about how foreign government should prosecute foreign fighters who return to their country. Um, no, no, no. Based on the crimes they have committed. Based on the crimes. Not, it's not the fact that uh, you have been somewhere 
that justifies that you are prosecuted. I believe in the, uh, in the British legislation, the crimes committed by British citizens abroad can be brought to court. Um, and that is what I thought. I mean, those foreign fighters that have committed crimes should be facing the justice. Sir, oh, sorry, I wanted to finish my question. So would you, sorry. Um, so would you therefore be against the British policy called by senior intelligence officers in the UK and also politicians who call for IS foreign fighters to be killed on the battlefield? So who? Um, so many British, British, British politicians have called on IS foreign fighters, British IS foreign fighters to be killed on the battlefield instead of being allowed to be come back to the UK. What is your stance on that? Well, I have never heard this and uh, I, I mean, I don't think anybody can wish that uh, uh, letting people being killed is the solution of all problems. I, I do believe that those British citizens or Portuguese citizens or whatever citizens that have committed crimes and come back should be prosecuted according to law. Jeffrey Robertson, I'm a trustee of SOAS. Thank you for honoring us with your presence this evening. Next Wednesday will be a red letter day for the United Nations and its contribution to the rule of law. General Mladic, charged as the architect of genocide, the worst form of terrorism, in Srebrenica will receive his verdict in the last trial at the court dealing with former Yugoslavia. That court has convicted, I think, 167 international criminals, none of them from Africa. And uh, there Jeffrey you have question. the record. What future do you see for international justice mechanisms, given the reluctance of African countries particularly to go with the ICC? But I think we, we should pay tribute to Africa in the sense that most African countries have ratified uh, the Paris, the Rome uh, Statute. Um, and uh, even if there is sometimes a, a debate that is not so positive, uh, the fact is, with the exception of Burundi, all African countries remain in the ICC. And I think that the, mo the, 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 the difficult moment uh, is overcome in my opinion. I think the difficult moment is overcome. The grievance of the Africans was to say that uh, uh, why only Africans are uh, being targeted. The problem is that, unfortunately, in the other conflict areas, the countries involved are countries that have not uh, signed or ratified the, the, uh, the Rome Statute, like Syria, like Iraq, etc. And the Security Council has shown a uh, very clear reluctance in sending whoever uh, to the ICC for reasons that uh, are related to what I said about national sovereignty and, and, the, and, the, and the human rights agendas. But I am a believer that international um, penal justice is an absolutely vital instrument for our world. And it's not only a question of justice and deterrence. I think it is, it is clear for me that the problems we have today cannot be solved by countries alone, in general. It's true, it's obvious for me that we need multilateral governance solutions, and one of the multilateral government solu governance solutions is related to penal justice that is administered internationally when countries are not able to do it by themselves. So I think we should do everything possible to support the International uh, Criminal Court and to create the conditions for more and more countries to be able to uh, join. And we should call the Security Council members to be able to fully accept their responsibilities, referring the cases that are justifiable to the ICC as it should happen. We've got over time, but if everyone is disciplined, I'm going to take three more questions. So one here, then one here, um, and then uh, the, the gentleman uh, here, right next to you, to your left. Okay, let's go. Boa uh, tarde. My name is Maria, and I'm a second year economics and politics in SAAS. And my question for you is in regards to what you said about the response in Manchester. So what happens when people and countries don't respond like the people in Manchester do? 
And what can the UN do in order to ensure that the response to terrorism is one of peace and love and positivity other than hate and, and this kind of shift that we've seen in a lot of uh, Europe and, and North America into a more protectionist uh, view? Well, I think we should st stand up for our values. And uh, I'm, as I said, a true believer in multilateralism. I'm a true believer. Globalization is, I think, irreversible. I think we need a more fair globalization, but it's, it is a total nonsense to think that we can revert to a nationalistic, inward-looking position. And uh, I think we need to fight for those values. And what the UN can do uh, is uh, to use all its instruments uh, uh, in order to be able that, uh, to express those values and to facilitate all those organizations in the civil society and all those uh, entities that are able to fight for, the, for those values. I mean, uh, there is no way, these are things that you cannot impose on people. These are things that you need to engage and to need to discuss and you need to promote uh, with all the instruments uh, that you have at your disposal. Short. <laughs> it will be. <laughs> um, my name is Phil Clark. I teach issues of conflict and justice uh, here at SOAS. Uh, Secretary General, my, my question is, you, you've emphasised prosecutions very heavily tonight uh, as one of the key mechanisms for tackling terrorism. So the? Uh, prosecutions. prosecutions. You, you've emphasised courts and trials very heavily. But, but I wonder, d does that suggest that you don't think that two other key mechanisms that have often been used to tackle conflict are, are not applicable in, in cases of terrorism. Namely, the use of amnesties for terrorists uh, and the role of negotiations with, with terrorist organisations. Um, is your position, is the position of the UN more broadly that amnesties and talking to terrorists are completely off the table? Thank you. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, humanitarians talk to terrorists. And I, in the past, and uh, I believe uh, uh, the same has happened to um, Valerie, uh, we have discussed access uh, for humanitarian action to uh, areas where terrorist organizations operate. Um, I remember Syria. In areas of uh, al-Nusra domination, it was possible to have humanitarian access and we have to talk with them. So, I mean, to talk is not the problem. Amnesties, I don't think, are the solution. I think a culture in which uh, we use amnesties as a tool pretending to, that we solve, uh, that to create conditions for peace agreements based on amnesties, I think it's an illusion. In my opinion, uh, it is essential to have accountability associated with all peace uh, processes and to guarantee and then we can have different mechanisms of uh, justice, transitional justice, uh, justice and reconciliation, truth. Ju I mean, there are many mechanisms and uh, there are different experiences that have been used in the world that were quite positive. But just to say, OK, let's uh, forget about everything uh, and please do it, do it again next time. This is, I don't think, a good idea. OK. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. So my question is, um, there have been successful models for, excuse me, there have been successful models, oh, my name is Wandi, and uh, uh, I'm from CISD, um, but there have been successful models for prosecuting uh, war crime uh, criminals. For example, the United Nations had, had one uh, after the end of uh, World War II. So what is the role of the United Nations uh, facilitating these kind of things in areas that have uh, conflict, and why has that kind of fallen off? Now, the international we have created some courts uh, in some specific areas, and I mean the, the ex Yugoslavia is a f fantastic example. But there are other examples of courts, for instance uh, Rwanda, uh, that have worked, uh, in my opinion, in an extremely positive way. And we could go on giving several other examples. At a certain moment, there was the, the idea, which I think is a very good idea. It's better instead of having a court for each situation that. Uh, justifies it to have an international criminal court. Unfortunately, there are many countries that, not, that are not parties to the uh, statute. That, and because of that, um, uh, and knowing that, uh, uh, the Security Council has the right to 
um, uh, ask the court uh, to act uh, in a certain number of circumstances where the countries themselves are not members to uh, the statute, and because of that, the court cannot act by itself. Unfortunately, as I said, we have witnessed in the recent past that there is very little appetite of the Security Council to do so. And this is a major concern for us. There's a young lady who had her hand up almost from the beginning. Um, I'm gonna, if it's really short, you can have your question. Really short. Hi, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, my name is Cecilia. I'm a student at CSD here at SOAS. My question is not about terrorism, but in general because you mentioned youth, and we are a lot of students here. Seeing how recent events at the United Nations is mostly youth speaking to youth, or when we get the opportunity to speak to other head of member states or similar uh, people, they only dismiss us. Uh, how do you plan personally to get the youth more involved to solve issues in the world today? Thank you. To get youth more involved? Yes, and to solve the problems of the world. And this is your final question, Antonio, so go for it. <laughs> that is the question I would like to know how to answer. Because if I would know how to answer, we would be working very uh, strongly in that direction and we are still struggling to do it. Um, the empowerment of youth is, uh, in my opinion, a fundamental mechanism to address all these problems. Not only terrorism, but many others. International organizations like the UN have difficulty in First of all, and I think the same happens to governments in general, as difficulties to communicate with the youth, it's also a generational question. Our, our system of communication, and I hope that uh, the new uh, and the Secretary General of Communication, that is, by the way, a British citizen and is sitting with us today, will be able to address and solve this problem. Our system of communication no is not youth friendly. It's not youth friendly. It's still sometimes a little bit dinosauric. No? And, uh, um, and, and the way uh, uh, youths communicate and interact today is very different from the generation that is in power in, the most, in most political structures at national level and at international level and in the UN. And so this is the first difficulty. And the second difficulty is that the problem is not only a problem of communication, the problem is how can we make sure that young people can indeed participate in uh, the political processes, in the peace negotiations, in, uh, uh, the, different, uh, in the definition of policies. And there uh, we are clearly lagging behind what would be useful more. I think we are, um, uh, we are witnessing a situation in which with the aging of societies, and this is happening, um, more and more decisions are taken based on a majority of citizens of my age, I would say, even if most of these decisions will have essentially an impact in the lives of young people. And this is a problem that modern democracies have not yet solved. And I believe that we need to work hard to be able to solve this problem at national level, and we need to work hard to solve this problem at the level of international organizations like the UN, where the empowerment of use and the full participation of use in decision-making processes is not yet working properly. And Antonio, what you have not mentioned is that you've appointed a youth envoy, and the first thing that you said to her, because I met her last week, was that her job was to be disruptive of the organisation. Yes. Which I think tells its own story. And I told her, please misbehave. And you told her to misbehave. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Antonio Guterres. to all of you whose questions uh, we could not get in, but I think you would all agree that uh, a wide-ranging speech, a huge agenda, and a huge amount for us to do. So once again, Antonio, thank you very much indeed.